Welcome to Firing Line. I'm Mike Kinsley of the New Republic magazine. During World War II, Harold Macmillan made his famous remark that from now on, Britain's role in the world would be as Greece to America's Rome, teaching the brash young empire how it's done. But these days, most analogies between America and the Roman Empire are of the decline and fall variety. So what role does that leave for Britain? Britain spent the 1980s in what the corporate world likes to call a turnaround situation. It looked as if the country's long economic decay might be reversing, and Mrs. Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher, the Prime Minister, became a leading player on the international stage. But recent economic news has been discouraging. Mrs. Thatcher's polls are terrible, and events in continental Europe have led many to believe that Germany, and not Britain, is the European nation poised for renewed greatness. Christopher Hitchens has vicious fun with the Greece and Rome analogy in his new book about Britain and America. He also has some vicious fun with William F. Buckley's Anglophilia. The book is called Class, excuse me, Blood, Class, and Nostalgia, subtitle Anglo-American Ironies. Mr. Hitchens is a prominent British journalist who has lived in New York and Washington for a decade now. He is a columnist for The Nation and Washington editor of Harper's Magazine. He embodies everything conservatives mean when they say, America, love it or leave it. John O'Sullivan, by contrast, embodies Anglo-American special relationship at its most incestuous. It's incestuous. Only Alastair Cook has succeeded in having, it for bo in having it both ways for longer. In the 70s, Mr. O'Sullivan worked for the Daily Telegraph in London. Then he was editor of Policy Review at the Heritage Foundation in Washington. Then he was back at the Telegraph and the Times in London. Then he was editorial page editor of the New York Post. Then he was associate editor of the London Times and a special advisor to Mrs. Thatcher in London. In 1988, he came back to New York as editor of the National Review, and that's where he sits, at least for the moment. Mr. Buckley, Japan and Germany don't give any sign of even wanting America for their Greece. Given that, if everyone's being knocked down a peg, it doesn't seem to me there's much of a role left for Britain at all. Well, I think that's uh, really a theme that Mr. Hitchens plays with in his, uh, in his book. His tendency is always, of course, uh, disruptive and iconoclastic. And, uh, uh, but this, this is part of his, um, uh, his voice setting, so it shouldn't necessarily distract one from what he's trying to say. The, the, the thing about Great Britain, I think, is that, uh, um, oh, 40 years ago, when I got out of college, people were saying, it, it, it's, it's over, it has nothing, nothing left to say. Uh, but um, that doesn't seem really to have been uh, uh, the case. It may very well be that this is primarily, uh, as you acknowledge, uh, in some respects, an accident of, uh, of, 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 of language. John Lucas once said, the single most important fact of the first 50 years of the 19th, 20th century, future historians will note, uh, is that uh, Americans speak English. And the most important fact of the last 50 years may prove to be that Russians are white. Now, that's, that's, that's a form of reductionism, but um, it, it's something that um, launches us on the question of uh, uh, is England as, as dead as she's supposed to be? Is she? Well, I've said in the book not, because yeah, they, um, just as people were beginning to write the old country off, and as even Churchill was admitting defeat, which is what he did at his famous appearance at Fulton in 1946. His last major speech. His last major speech, in <laughs> effect, was he said, you know, we're, we're through, we've borne the heat and burn of the day, the torch has to be passed, but fortunately we have our American cousin, and the British spirit, as it were, must enter this new and young and vigorous body, and that will give us um, a further say and a further lease on life. And the first stage in doing that, really, of course, was what um, someone well known to you, James Burnham, called the receivership mm -hmm. into which the United States took the British Empire. If you look at where American foreign policy is now concentrated, from Pakistan to Palestine and so on, it's an inheritance from the British Empire. And the other is obviously cultural. Um, one of my favorite examples is to say to people, well, is George Wallace a wasp? And people say, not really, no, he seems rather a vulgar chap and so on. But, but I say well, he's very white, extremely Anglo-Saxon, very Protestant were the things about George Wallace. You say, is William Buckley a wasp? And they say, absolutely, he's what's meant by wasp. And I say, well, white enough, but in fact Irish and Catholic in provenance. So wasp is a term of class as well as of um, ethnicity in America. And that's impossible to understand unless you understand the special way in which America is appealed to by the British imagination. Uh, you, uh, cynically or non-cynically? I would say genuinely. Both. I would say genuinely that there is, there is a real affection that's mm -hmm. based on a common sacrifice in war. Mm 
on blood, on language, on literature, and so on. And there are certain kinds of emulation which I attack in the book. I think a rather pathetic sort of showbiz attitude to the British royal family, for example. Mm. And in politics, too easy a resort to things like Kipling and Churchill and the windier aspects of British imperial bluster when some piece of American foolishness needs to be defended overseas. It's too easy to reach for this sort of stock of metaphors. O'Sullivan and his newspapers that do it all the time, they say, this is Munich, you know, uh, if we don't take our stand here, America will be dragged in the mire. They appeal to the Churchillian, the John Bull spirit. So we vanquish the Falk Falkland Islands. Well, exactly, and the Malvinas go down and so mm -hmm. forth. And that this is, but this is testimony to an extraordinary durability of English imagery and, and culture in America, even though it's been mutated in this slightly su suspect way. You Sorry for such a long burst. You got a problem well, with that? Yeah. I mean, um, if you read uh, Hit uh, um, Mr. Hitchens's book, I think you get a picture of the relationship, which is half true, or rather, the half that's true is emphasized. Uh, half that's true is neglected, and the half that's not true is is emphasized. Now, essentially, England and America are two different powers. They're two different states, but the two constitute in a sense, a single cultural community, along with other countries. And that there's a political community there as well. So that in England, uh, which is a kind of sub-theme not developed in the book, um, the left has often looked to the United States. It's admired American institutions, it's admired republicanism, uh, the lack of an aristocracy, uh, what it misperceived as a, as a classless society. Of course, America does have classes as well. Uh, and it's perfectly true that conservative forces in America have looked back towards England uh, and admired certain elements of English uh, life. And the imperial ethic was one of them, a willingness to play a major role in the world. Now, um, this, it seems to me, is evidence that the two countries uh, will often be um, arguing and debating. <coughs> um, but it's, it's a, not exactly two countries. It's two different political traditions in each country, arguing it out. Now, Mr. Hitchens is an example just as much as I am, and indeed, uh, Mr. Kinsley is an example just as much as I am, uh, of the ability of the special relationship to be a left as well as a right-wing uh, set of ideas. So we're left and right, and the fact is that the two countries um, at different times have, uh, uh, have represented the left or right. At the moment, for example, now that the Cold War is, so to speak, waning, and your book is a very much a Cold War book product, I mean, you're attacking Britain in American terms for leading America into the Cold War. Mm. I think that's a mistake. But I think it was a mistake. I think the, the, <laughs> the, 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 uh, it's a mistake to think we did it. I mean, the person who pushed America into the Cold War was Joseph Stalin. Who, whose links with England are extremely remote. Now, but the crystallization did come as a result of the Fulton speech, I think. Well, I think it came as, a, as the, the Fulton speech was at the time well, considerably attacked, and internally the Truman administration was very nervous about it, didn't welcome it, thought that Churchill was, was too extreme going off his rocker. Um, the, uh, the American establishment reacted very, very ambiguously to it. It was only when everything that Churchill said was confirmed by Stalin um, and when you had the blockade of Berlin, the coup in Czechoslovakia, uh, and finally, of course, the invasion uh, of uh, Korea by the North, South Korea by the North Koreans, that there was a, um, a, a rallying to the standard raised by Churchill. But bear in mind, John, why they didn't like the speech, because half of it, sorry to borrow your analogy of the halves, was, was off its rocker. It was saying that the United States should make an alliance with Britain against communism. And the first step in this was for the United States to come to the rescue of the British Empire. That the, that the United States and the British Empire, including India and Africa, were to become the same condominium. And it seems to me that what the United States took from the speech was what it wanted, which was a clarion call against communism within and without, um, and dumping all the sentimental appeal via rhetoric and tradition that they <coughs> rescue the empire. But, but paradoxically, or as I prefer to put it ironically, um, <laughs> taking on an imperial character in doing this. I, I, that's I've always that's my th theory in a nutshell. I, I've, I've always assumed that um, there, there was a, a certain amount of uh, Aesopian language in the Fulton speech uh, in which Churchill was saying something which is better communicated than expressed, or at least more easily so, namely, we, we, we had our burdens during the 19th century, we British, and during the pers first part of this century, our fleet uh, tranquilized uh, the world. We don't have it anymore. We were exhausted by the Second World War. 
plus the impulse to separatism, which I declined uh, explicitly to endorse, you, you, you've, got, you've got to take over, in a sense. But, but you don't say it in those words because it sounds, uh, it sounds uh, like uh, too much self-abnegation mm -hmm. and politically mm -hmm. it's impossible to say. Uh, is that not a fair reading of what he was yes. saying that first half? I would say it was, and in the same way as, for example, Kipling's most famous poem, about which I have a chapter, is called The White Man's Burden. It's mm -hmm. one of the few lines of Kipling everybody knows, take up the white man's burden. Now, people have, I've found are surprised to find Kipling wrote that poem directly as an address to the United States. Mm -hmm. But it's obvious from the line, because you wouldn't, you wouldn't talk to the country that already had the white man's burden, namely Britain, and tell it to take it up. Mm. What, in fact, is being said by Kipling to the United States is take over the white man's burden. It's made very clear. And it was addressed to Congress in, in the hope that Congress would an annex the Philippines, which it did. But, but when Kipling, when Kipling uh, wrote those lines, <coughs> uh, uh, the historical perspective of, say, 150 or 200 years uh, justified what uh, you now, I think, uh, uh, consigned as an act of condescension. Hmm. Wh whatever was going on in India, which nobody I know of defends, even you, uh, stopped going on when the white men said, don't do that. Don't, don't make widows burn themselves on the pile of their husbands. Uh, well, uh, Marx himself said that the British influence on India was, <clears throat> in some uh, extent and degree, a civilizing influence, that it broke up the caste system and, and millennial slavery, yes. Why do you say but Marx Kipling himself? Why do you say Marx himself? Well, it's, it's not expected of Marx that he would have defended the British putting down the Indian mutiny, but he did do so. So, I mean, on the argument of evidence against presumed interest, it's more to be remarked upon than other cases. But Kipling, no, I think, you see, was much more far-sighted than people give him credit for. He, yeah, but he this, could this, see the exhaustion of that This didn't on. get the way, in the way of Marx's proletariat uh, thing. He wasn't talking about the proletariat being put down. No, by no means. And so, so that therefore, it, it, it oughtn't to have surprised you that Marx would have made that comment. It doesn't Maybe surprise me. I guess I was hoping it might surprise you. But, <laughs> but, but can we get on to this passing the torch? It seems to me that two points are important here. First of all, England used to be one of the, the greatest power in the world. It is now a medium-sized power, which doesn't mean to say it's not important in all sorts of ways, but nonetheless, it doesn't have the grand role it had. Now, what's missing, in, it seems to me, in your book? You talk about ties of blood, ties of class, uh, class and ties of nostalgia. You never talk about the ideas that to some extent unite England and America and which when England ceased to be the predominant power in the world made it clear that the English would like to hand that torch onto America and not to anybody else. It wasn't just questions of interest. It was that in America the English saw, and I think largely still do see, a country which represented more or less the same ideals. But they also see progeny. They see progeny as well, mm -hmm. but it's much easier to hand on to a country in which it believes also roughly in free trade, in democracy, in a liberal international order, and which has, so to speak, a stewardship view of the world, rather than simply a plundering power. And a record of stability. And a record of stability, and institutions which, even when they differ, as say the Supreme Court does, nonetheless differ in a recognizable and understandable way. So I think it was easy for the English. Well, not easy, there are elements of resentment, and we used to run the show, and now we no longer do. All those kind of passions and irritants exist. But nonetheless, it was possible to say, America is the country which we would like to see uh, succeed us, rather than any other power. Well, I think that's true, and I probably should have said more about it, but it is noticeable what kinds of borrowing you, in fact, come across. Um, for example, um, the United, many people in the United States admire, and I've noticed this especially since the televising of Westminster Parliament, uh, the tradition of the British Question Time, where the Prime Minister just has to get up and take it, and there's no evading it twice a week. And I can see why Americans admire it, because they can not easily imagine Presidents Reagan or Bush hmm. surviving that, and I think there's a... It's a, a, a decent envy to have. Mm. But you never get that kind of call, or haven't until recently. No one in America sort of wants to borrow anything like the British National Health Service, for example, either, which would be another excellent bit of emulation. Instead, what you tend to get is what I got yesterday, actually, when by chance I had to call an emergency room in a hospital. And before I could blurt out why I needed one, the woman said, where are you from? I just love your accent. <laughs> it's real neat. Why did you just keep talking? And I said, well, madam, I know we have a reputation for politeness, <laughs> but I must insist on it. This happens to me a lot. And what it is actually is a kind of snobbery, a sort of inferiority complex. Why can't I go into a supermarket without seeing a picture of Princess Diana who I left England to get away from. But then this cultural thing works uh, in reverse as well, doesn't it? For example, well, when I go exactly, you see, the same if I go back to England, what do I get? McDonald's hamburgers and American nuclear bases. So well, it seems to me there's something in the relationship that tends to reinforce the conservative and the commercial 
and the, what shall we say? Excuse the, me. You would delight in saying the reaction. I think it's odd to want to get away from Princess Diana. You do? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, if, if she were frumpy, frowsy, and banal, well, then you, you might want let to me get put it like this. I'd like to do the same thing as I suspect she'd like to do and get away at least from her husband. <laughs> um, in other words, from the, the uh, popular celebration of, of the House of Windsor, I could, I could do with the rest from that, and I thought I could get it in in the country of George Washington, which went to all this trouble not just to expel the monarchy, but to make sure it could never come back. Let me suggest, but by the way... Now you have an imperial let, presidency. Let so. me suggest why your book concentrates on the um, cooperation uh, between the right wing in both countries to promote an imperial ideal, and why it neglects the left wing interest in, in, in borrowing American democratic and republican institutions. Because this theme disappeared from British left wing thought in the early 70s, and is only now reappearing with the waning of the Cold War, when you've got Charter 88, which although it borrows its name from Czechoslovakia, nonetheless is a left wing organization in Britain designed to borrow American ins political institutions and transplant them in order to prevent Mrs. Thatcher continuing to run the country. <laughs> now, now now, you neglect this because during, that, during the, the 70s and the 80s, the theme of the British left has been that Britain is an occupied country, that America is an occupying power, uh, that we're simply a province in, in the American empire. The and your book is a sophisticated, yeah. exactly, sophisticated, uh, moderate and entertaining version of that theory. Yeah, that's fair enough. I mean, to the, I, but I'm, I'm a founding signatory of Charter 88. And I think one can have it both ways. In fact, I'm wedded to the view one can have it both ways. I think you can have an American constitution explicitly modelled on the American Bill of Rights, which is self-written by some very fine English colonists. There's no need for you know, national very disloyal self ones. No, no, very disloyal ones. Modelled model model on the Bill of Rights, uh, uh, critically minded guys. And um, there's no need, in other words, for any national self-hatred about this. And uh, one can have that w without having the presence of uh, nuclear bases, which are governed by no treaty and ratified by no parliamentary agreement. Uh, which I think does qualify the country to be, uh, to be so as, the, Orwell, as Orwell described it when it happened first, occupied. And th th those were even in wartime. Well, as a matter of fact, what Orwell said was that he met a man, he, he read a piece about a, um, in which a man said the American troops were in Britain not to invade Germany, but in order to suppress a British revolution. He said, you have to be an intellectual to say things like that. <laughs> no ordinary person could be so stupid. Yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's true, and I, and I deserve it. But you'll remember the, the, the uh, piece... Um, about the soldiers in Piccadilly and so forth. And the, the, the fact that, it, the, the, that the troops and bases were welcomed, so why in that case didn't the government be you're honest about saying we have allowed our territory to take You're not suggesting the Americans wouldn't go if asked? Excuse no, me, excuse me, uh, 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 you're They speaking, came without being asked. You're speaking awfully fast. I don't always follow you. Uh, <laughs> are, are you, are you suggesting me. that there's something surreptitious about the existence of nuclear bases in Great Britain? In the book, I quote the then Secretary of Defense, Forrestal, yeah. who, as you know, came to a sticky end, but was then in a lucid interval, who said, as far as he knew, uh, there had never before been an agreement by, where, whereby one power stationed its forces on the territory of another without a treaty, without any formal written understanding of any kind. Many smaller and weaker countries, such as the Philippines, have a ratified, renewable agreement in that the United Kingdom just doesn't have. This well, testifies, in, 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 in my view, in the to the latent place, strength of the special relationship. People don't Forrest think Forrest of Aldad, Americans as foreign. Forrest Forrest Aldad, in 1946, he was a lawyer, an international lawyer, as, as a specialist, and for him to say this is the first time that something has happened does not suggest that it's outrageous. By no means. Uh, I mean, uh, not of itself, no. The, the fire bombing of Dresden had never happened before, and it was also outrageous. <coughs> but the, uh, uh, the, yes. the, ev the evolution of, uh, of NATO uh, is not something that suggests, um, other than that, uh, England, as a partner of NATO, would have um, carried uh, its share of the responsibility to make NATO effective. Mm. Uh, it, it seems to me that in your, in, in, in your book you attach uh, a kind of importance to that that uh, uh, is, isn't uh, earned, that I can see. Well, if I, don't, if I don't carry the point in that way, I, I don't know if I'll be able to convince you now. I think there is a difference, though, and I, I make it by contrast with de Gaulle, who once mm -hmm. asked the commander of American forces in his country, you like that, yeah. Yeah, can you tell me how many American nuclear weapons there are in France? So the guy said, I can, but I'm not allowed to. You're not allowed to know that. And de Gaulle said, well, all right, but no, no French president will ever be talked to in those terms ever again, and meant it. Without removing France from the West, he said, "No, we, we, there are certain decisions we'll, we will not find out have been taken for us." The British government, in, um, in other words, is quite prepared to find out second what American military and nuclear policy is, even though it's committed its 
country and its national territory as a forward basin. I mean, it may not be as well known here as it is in England to your audience, but a lot of British people don't like that. And I'm well, well, did uh, you all tell Spain what you got in Gibraltar? Hmm? Do you all tell Spain what you got in Gibraltar? Well, I'm for the I'm for the restoration of all these uh, anomalies um, to their to their. Uh, but 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 uh, the, the fact that you, sh you right should be r really I think makes uh, makes a bit more of a of a, of a template uh, for that which is surreal. The fact of the matter is that we guarded the peace in Europe for 40 years mm. through a series of arrangements, some of which were anomalous, as for instance De Gaulle's separation sure. uh, from uh, formal separation. But we kept the peace. Uh, uh, and uh, all of a sudden things have got to go our way, well, let's say, even say your way, mm, uh, in, East, uh, in East, uh, East Europe. Now, uh, but, but you seem to be, you seem to want to go back and say, ah, but they, there were certain uh, uh, legal uh, anomalies and solecisms here that uh, historically disturbed me. Well, they can disturb you, it seems to me, uh, only if you're, you insist on a kind of a reading of history that history doesn't ever lend itself to. It doesn't strike you then that the that this what we've been talking about this uh, unspoken treaty nuclear treaty suggests a, an amazingly deep latent connection between the two countries. It does. That's it all I'm really saying. It does. Yeah. And in fact, but, but it's, one, it's one that I applaud. I, incidentally, I never thought of myself as, as an anglophiliac, uh, and yeah. I, I've been denounced as an anglophobe, which I, God knows I'm not. But that's irrelevant. Uh, we, we have common interests. And also, we can communicate. Uh, I don't read German journals, but I read English journals. Uh, and uh, mm. uh, uh, isn't that one of the reasons why there is a more natural affinity than there would be, say, with uh, Germany or to be sure, France? Yes. And to be also, sure. one I think which is going to develop, because I, um, I don't think we've reached the end of this story, though uh, uh, Mr. Hitchens may. It seems to me that with the development of Europe, the reason why the Americans always wanted the British in the European community was because they would represent, they thought, the ideas of free trade and free markets, which would mean that the community would never be closed to American goods and American capital and so on. And that is now going to become very important as the European community uh, grows, incorporates the... With the threat of 1992. With yeah. the threat of 1992. And, uh, if Britain now has a distinctive role in this area, I would say it is to represent the ideals of free trade and free markets within the community, which might develop in an autarkic and protectionist direction, and eventually to lead, um, with the reduction of tariff barriers between the two sides of the Atlantic, to the development of some kind of economic equivalent of NATO, which uh, the Americans uh, would benefit from, the British would certainly benefit from, but so would the Europeans. That's just not enough about my book, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's all good stuff, but I mean, it's not enough about me. You haven't even said whether you liked it. Oh, but I did like the book. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, and what's more, but I have to ask I myself... I thought you liked the Kipling I, thing. I have to example. ask the question that was the famous question that was asked in the Lady Chatterley trial. Would you let your wife or servant read this book? I think, um, would you let someone who didn't know a lot about the subject already read it? I'd have doubts. They get a very distorted view. I think I'd let them read it in the, in the event of giving them five other books, four of them by Bill. Uh, on, that, on that note of a plug for your employer, <laughs> uh, let me ask Mr. Buckley, how do you react to Mr. Hitchens's charge that you're masquerading as a wasp, or at least to his more serious point underneath it, that one of the cultural ironies is America's borrowing of a British class snobbery that is, many people think, is man manifested, among other ways, in, in the way you talk? Well, I, I can't think of a single occasion in my public or private life in which I have tried to disguise the fact that I'm a Roman Catholic. I'm a professing Roman Catholic to the extent that that excludes me from being a wasp. It's, it's the <laughs> loss of the wasp, <laughs> not of the Catholics. So uh, 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 wasp has simply become uh, a, a, a word, as far as I can see, that simply designates uh, 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 people who are really traditionalists uh, and uh, I suppose non-Jewish or, or, I don't know, I, I, I can even imagine, I can even think of some Jews who I think of as wasps. I would have thought a wasp means someone who is not an accredited victim. Yeah, 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 that would be a Joe Sobern. Uh, uh, it certainly would, victim. I can just hear him saying it. Um, <laughs> I've campaigned for some time to drop the W, um, because I think it's superfluous. <laughs> yeah. I think one could reasonably say these people are asps, for example. <laughs> there are no basps, um, or yasps, and are unlikely to be. Um, so it's a work of supererogation, but um, it's noticeable that you can be, without offense, even though hyphenation's in decline, called an Italian-American or a Greek-American, German-American. But the idea 
of an English American is that there's something axiomatically mm -hmm. absurd about it that I think is interesting. Again, it doesn't offend me, it intrigues me. There is, I think this is because what the is because instead... Because they have the incidents originally of English settlers. Yes. Yeah. The original settlement, um, the swarming of the English, as uh, Woodrow Wilson calls it in his history, and the presence of Englishmen in America. But the, the reason why a that and is... And their dominance. The reason why that seems so, it, so imbricated, so natural to the whole texture of the thing is, is therefore what I mean by the, the blood and nostalgia bit, if not the class. Not just, of course, the English. But the, the Scots-Irish, the Ulstermen, were a major part of the early settlement. But again, people don't regard them as a separate group. They often describe themselves as Irish. I believe they're 57% of those who describe themselves as Irish in America. But they're, they're not you Irish in the... Yes, that's right, and from Ulster. But they're not mm. part of the Irish in the sense that they have this uh, strong sentimental connection to Ireland, uh, which is sometimes expressed in sympathy for Irish republicanism. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Christopher Hitchens, author of Blood, Class and Nostalgia, which you are authorized by Mr. Uh, uh, by my confederate here to read, provided you mix it up with a few other books. Right? <laughs> <laughs> thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Right.